Senator Benson, Senate File 1168. Thank Before you, us. Madam Chair. I'd place uh, I'd move Senate File. 1168 before this body and members, um, there's been a lot of public conversation about the topic of abortion. And actually, a friend of one of my sons was in a speech class and she was talking about the impact of 3D abortions on, or 3D ultrasounds on women who were contemplating abortion. She came to me and she said, with all the conversation, is there anything that we can do in Minnesota? And I had carried this bill last year. And then she put me in touch with a doctor who runs a free ultrasound clinic. And that doctor talked to me for an hour and a half on a Friday night and explained all the stages of development that women come into her clinic sometimes with the dad, sometimes with a friend, and they see the ultrasound at whatever stage of development for this baby, and they have that moment of realization when they are not just pregnant, that they have a baby. And there are tears sometimes, and there is fear sometimes, but they see the profile and the face, and the fingers. We can see hair on ultrasounds now. And so these moms and dads who are facing a new challenge because of an ultrasound come to the realization that they are parents. So that is why I'm bringing this bill today, because we need to have this conversation. So in the preparation for an abortion, a doctor may require an ultrasound. This bill doesn't demand an ultrasound. Not unlike the ultrasound that I talked about earlier, the doctor looks at the baby. But we're not requiring that the mother be shown the ultrasound. We're just requiring that the doctor offer that if an ultrasound's performed, that it can be viewed by the mother undergoing this procedure. Ponder, if you will, any circumstance where a doctor would perform a test and not offer the results to the patient. So all we're asking is that if, a te if this test, if this diagnostic test is performed on a woman, that she be offered the opportunity to learn what we can glean from that test. We do have some testifiers here to tell you why they support this bill, and of course there are some who are in opposition. That is the nature of what we do. And so first I would like to call up Ms. Andrea Rao. Hello, Ms. Rao. Please state your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Andrea Rao, and I represent Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Life. MCCL is Minnesota's oldest and largest uh, grassroots pro-life organization. And as Senator Benson uh, said, um, and this is really very straightforward legislation. Uh, it does not require hardly anything at all. Uh, it doesn't require an ultrasound to be done, even though that is the standard of care in abortion procedures. Um, it merely says if an ultrasound is going to be done, they, it is required that the woman be asked if she wants to view it. It allows the decision to be made by the woman, um, by nobody else but herself, if she wants to see it or not. The reality is, is some women do regret the decision to have an abortion. Uh, many women do not, some women do. Those that are most likely to regret are the ones that maybe when they're there at the table, undergoing this procedure, starting the process, they would like to see. They're not 100% certain, but they've convinced themselves for the moment that they're gonna go through with it. Those are the women that are most likely to regret later in life. I think we can all agree 
that we don't want any woman to ever have an abortion and later regret that decision. That's a decision that she can never come back from. That's what this legislation is about. It's not about changing a woman's mind. It's not about telling a woman that she can't have an abortion if that's what she wants. It's not about shaming women um, and requiring them to, to look at something they don't want to see. It's not about any of that. It's about making sure that a woman has every bit of information in front of her so that she can make the decision that is best for herself. And that is what this legislation seeks to do. And that is why we are so grateful that Chair Benson is, is bringing it forward. Uh, we think it's a very important step in the direction of, of making sure that women are really fully informed and able to make these decisions. Thank you, Ms. Rao. Thank you. To the next testifier. And Ms. Madam Benson? Chair, Ms. Rao does have some written testimony that she would like um, <coughs> to include. And Senator Benson, is it in our packet? Madam Chair, um, it is not, unfortunately. Ann Taylor was on the list to testify today. Um, she had provided me with a copy of her testimony, okay. but unfortunately, last minute, she was unable to attend because okay. her child was sick. Um, I would be happy. I have one poorly copied version of her written testimony, and I'd be happy to submit that to the committee, but she did ask that I read it at least in part. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Okay. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, so this is the testimony of, of Ann Taylor, and, and she says, Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am a mom and frequent testifier in support of bills protecting our children, specifically in education. I'm also a licensed real estate assistant, grassroots organizer, part-time backstock supervisor, the family cook, and family planner, including but not limited to music lessons, concerts, and ballet practices. But before all of this, in my previous life, I lost two children to abortion, along with my late husband from an opioid overdose, all by the age of 30. Oh in 1998, I had my first abortion at a Planned Parenthood clinic where I was denied seeing the ultrasound image just moments before the actual abortion procedure took place. After waiting nearly three hours for my scheduled abortion, when my name was finally called, I was prepped as if I was going to have an annual pap smear. Well, the nurse began to spread a cool, clear gel on my abdomen to prep for the ultrasound. She flipped on a monitor and began to move the probe across my lower belly. I asked the nurse, can I see it? See what, she said, rather distant and not looking up. Timidly, I asked, can I see the picture? No, I'm afraid not today, was the nurse's response to my request. I was approximately 10 weeks along in the pregnancy. I know we're trying to move things along, so I'm going to skip just a, a little bit of it. Um, then she says, it is the standard of care to provide an ultrasound exam prior to an abortion. Senate file 1168 offers women the choice to accept or deny seeing this image of the fetus. I believe this absolutely should be used to counsel, as Senate File 1186 offers women the opportunity to accept or deny seeing an ultrasound image of the fetus any time prior to the performance of an abortion, and absolutely should be used as counsel prior to any surgical abortion procedure. Every patient has a right to oral consent and should not be coerced one way or another on the opportunity to either view or decline to view an active ultrasound image of an unborn child. I support this bill because I would not want another woman to be denied the right to view her ultrasound image the way I was. Women deserve to make their decisions based on all the information they have available before them. I don't know if I would have changed my mind had I seen the ultrasound photos. What I do know is that in order for women to make the best decision for themselves, they need to be offered their complete medical information and to decide for themselves whether or not they want to pursue an abortion based on that information. It's her right, her record, and her right to have this information. Please consider what I have had to say today regarding my abortion experience and support Senate File 1168. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rao. Please tell Ms. Taylor, thank you for her testimony. And members, if anybody would like a copy of that handwritten testimony, we can certainly get that to everyone. Perhaps we should do that. Thank you. And Super. Uh, Senator Benson. Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Stephanie Gavin. Ms. Gavin, welcome uh, to this uh, committee hearing, and please state your name for the record. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Chair and member of the committees, um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Stephanie Gavin. I was 18 when I found out I was pregnant. Like most women who are faced with an unplanned pregnancy, I was scared, confused, and panicked. I needed an out, a way to make my life go back to normal. I first thought that an abortion was probably my best option, but I knew that whatever decision I made would be life-changing, and I wanted to get as much information as possible. I ended up going to a place that did ultrasound, and they gave me the opportunity to watch the ultrasound, which I was glad for. I ended up, it ended up being the biggest factor in my final decision. Seeing what was actually going on inside my body resulted in me making the decision that was best for me. I can't think of any reason why all women considering abortion shouldn't at least be given the option to see their own ultrasound. Information is powerful and women deserve all the information that's available. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Gavin. Senator Benson. Thank you. And um, Madam Chair, I was told that there is someone who did want to speak against the bill, but I don't have their name on my list. And so if you would invite. Uh, yes, Ms. Andrea Ledger, Executive Direction from NARAL Pro-Choice, Minnesota. Thank you, Ms. Rao. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today against this bill. Uh, my name is Andrea Ledger. I'm the executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Minnesota. This bill singles out a safe medical procedure for unnecessary additional regulation and substitutes political judgment for that of medically trained professionals. According to a landmark study released last year called Safety and Quality of Abortion Care in the United States by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medi Medi excuse me, Medicine, complications from abortion are extremely rare. What can be extremely dangerous, according to the study's authors, are, quote, abortion-specific regulations in many states that create barriers to safe and effective care. The study specifically singled out state-mandated state ultrasound requirements as the type of clinical service that is best determined by a professionally trained physician and not mandated by legislation such as this. While an ultrasound can be an important tool for doctors when used for medically necessary reasons, bills like Senate File 3194 are designed to substitute politicians' judgment for a conversation that needs to happen between a woman and her doctor. You have written testimony from both the Minnesota Medical Association and the Minnesota section of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists opposing this bill because of its interference in that doctor-patient relationship. Just last year, Governor Dayton vetoed an identical bill, noting that, quote, providers are already fulfilling their legal, ethical, and professional duties to fully inform their patients of the benefits, risks, and alternatives of any medical procedure. The decision about if and when to have a child is deeply personal. A woman and her family in consultation with her doctor must make the decision that is right for them without interference from politicians. I urge you to oppose this bill and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's nothing that mandates an ultrasound. We leave that decision exclusively to the provider. We only say that if a test is performed on a woman, that the woman should have the opportunity to know the results of that test or the outcome of a diagnostic assessment. So a woman who has an ultrasound performed should be offered the opportunity to see the results of that ultrasound. There's no mandate for an ultrasound. Mandate was mentioned a couple of times. There's no mandate. Professional judgment remains at the beginning we just ask for a conversation because a conversation is important. As you stated, a conversation at this point in time is important. And there's often a mismatch of information. 
in making medical decisions. We want there to be as much shared information as possible in making this decision. So I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, questions um, for Ms. Ledger? Oh. Ms. Ledger, yes, I think there is a question for you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Ms. Ledger, You're welcome. Uh, for being here today. Yes. Uh, one thing I see is in the, the title here um, on our uh, agenda uh, that you're an organization for pro-choice. I would just ask you, what's wrong with giving the woman the choice to see her own body on an ultrasound? Mm -hmm. Why is that so wrong? I mean, we're not mandating it, uh, not requiring it, but if it is done, uh, to give the woman the choice to see the ultrasound of her own body. Why is, why is that, why are you opposed to that choice? Ms. Ledger. Madam Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, thank you for the question. It's not that I am opposed to the choice. I think this is, the opposition is a mandated conversation between a doctor and a patient. We have physicians who have years and years of medical training, who have professional standards, who already in the course of their care for any kind of procedure, any kind of uh, medical problem, are making sure that patients are aware of their test results and communicating those results from them. And our belief is that it's not necessary to single out this one procedure for a mandated conversation to take place. Senator Kiffmeyer. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Ledger, for that answer. I know that we just disagree on that, and I do think that uh, when I think of all of the areas that I've been involved with over my lifetime of being in, in nursing, that um, more and more uh, society has gone to, matter of fact, we have electronic medical records where I can go look up my own labs. It used to be a secret in there. I had to wait. And now I'm able to go see lab tests and lab results and see all kinds of things. They show us our x-rays. I mean, it's become a standard of being able to do that. What we're mandating here is for the woman to be given the choice. That's all. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do not see anywhere in the new language, which is simply lines 3.19 through 3.23, um, I don't see anything in this new language that talks about a conversation. The language in the bill, I would encourage everyone to just read those five lines. Um, it just states that the physician or the physician's agent shall orally inform the patient of the opportunity to view or decline to view, or to decline to view the active ultrasound image of the unborn child. That is only if an ultrasound has been performed. So I, I don't understand the concern about um, a conversation when specifically this simply states that if an ultrasound has been taken, that the woman should be provided the opportunity to view it or to decline to view it, uh, just like any other test result. So are, are you referring to other language in the bill or what are you basing the opposition on regarding a conversation? Ms. Ledger. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson, I think the, my interpretation of orally informing is a conversation. Um, that would be the, the physician or the physician's agent speaking to the patient. I Senator guess, Nelson. thank you, Madam Chair. I guess that's a, a, a pretty um, strict interpretation, uh, just ref informing them the, the opportunity to view or decline. So um, thank you for clarifying that. I just wanted to make sure that it, it was clear on the record that there's nothing uh, requiring any kind of conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Senator Benson, I have to say that I find this um, bill insulting to doctors and nurses, insulting to women, because it assumes that um, they haven't given this um, decision careful and thorough thought. Um, this bill undermines a long-standing practice of informed consent. A uh, patient and their doctor openly discuss the diagnosis, prognosis, and possible options privately and um, without outside interference. And it's not about health care. This bill's about shaming a woman for her decision to have 
to end a pregnancy. And um, women already have the right to see their ultrasound. I mean, this assumes that they don't know to ask for it. We have a legal, professional, and ethical obligation to share with a patient. I'm a registered nurse, and I have that obligation to share with a patient all relevant information before they go through a procedure that, that involves their health care. Um, like I said, I find this insulting to the uh, nursing profession, the, the medical profession, and to women in general. For the comments, Senator Franson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my comments uh, thank you. are, how would this be um, enforced? How do you see Senator Benson as, uh, how do you enforce this and make sure that doctors don't end up in litigation because they didn't sign a consent form that they've actually seen an ultrasound? I'm just being practical. I don't see how this bill actually solves the issue you're trying to address. Well, it fits under an existing section of law, so if a woman has an ultrasound and it's not offered, there's an existing section of law where they would have had to have been communicated with, it would fit under the informed consent laws that already exist. Senator Franson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have that language, Senator Benson, in front of me, so how would it work practically? Does a person um, who's seen the... Does a provider have to, how does that consent happen? I mean, it's oral, it doesn't seem, it could be your word against mine that I was offered the, to see an ultrasound or not in terms of that situation. It's usually two people in a, in a room. Um, I've never been in that situation, so I don't know if there's more, but I'm just practically asking what, how would this be enforced and how do you protect pro providers and patients that this is actually going to happen? Senator Benson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. It fits under the same communication in the language that starts on page 1.6, that all of those risks have to be communicated, medical risks, whether or not anesthesia will be used. So it's already existing law that we are adding to. Madam Chair. Senator Franson. So I keep hearing that it's not mandating an ultrasound, but I'm not a doctor or a nurse in this committee, but I have been pregnant before and have two <laughs> beautiful kids. And I know that to know how old and gestational period of, of how old your baby is, you. I don't think you can do that, but by your example, you actually, or sample, you actually have to get an ultrasound. Someone might correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you already have to have an ultrasound to even know we qualify for a legal abortion. And that's what we're talking about, legal abortion under our laws, which is, as I assume, safe abortion and regulated highly. Um, so you need to know that the fetus is of a certain gestational age to be able to legally have an abortion in our state. So how else would you know if, if not for an ultrasound? So you're saying we're not mandating an ultrasound, but I don't think you understand that it's, it's, it's assumed you're going to get an ultrasound if you're going to be having an abortion. That, Senator Benson. Uh, Madam Chair, we used to determine gestational age before there were ultrasounds available. There are other ways. Um, the, it's based on biology. Right. Well, so, Madam so Chair, friends. and again, I, I, I wish Dr. Klein or, or Dr. Jensen were here. Um, maybe they can elaborate because they're doctors. They're not obstetricians. But I have two letters in the packet from doctors, associations that represent doctors um, that I value highly. I've worked with both of them and know some of the names on, on one of them personally. And, and it disturbs me that when we're trying to meddle into their profession, they are not being heard, and I don't know if they're testifying here or if they're present here. I just have the letters. Um, and it, they represent quite a number of, 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 of doctors that are doing this on a daily basis or, or you know, taking care of women's health. Um, so I just find it um, hard to believe that we want to regulate uh, an industry when they're not asking to be regulated and, and they're following their expertise 
their ethical standards, and then we're here from the Capitol trying to tell them how to do something. We have no idea what it's like. And Madam Senator Chair, Benson. again, we are not mandating that they do anything outside their medical judgment. We are asking them to communicate the results of a diagnostic assessment with the patient. Um, frankly, we passed through this committee prescribing restrictions that they weren't happy about either. Madam Chair and Senator Frenson. Senator Benson, I, I, I know we do that. We do scope of practice, but we usually have them on uh, here talking about what they do and listen to them. Um, I just, I find it really hard to move something like this forward without getting particular specific information from doctors asking for them to have regulations in their practice. Um, and and Madam Chair, Senator Benson. to Senator Franzen's point, no one was told no. Anyone in the public is welcome to testify on this bill as they choose. And they chose to submit in written form. And we accept testimony in many forms, but if they choose written form instead of coming to the table answering questions, that is up to them. Madam Senator Chair, Frenzen. and I understand this is a, a delicate issue and it's very personal. That's why probably, you know, people don't talk about this that much. Um, there's a conversation out there. There are states that are going above and beyond. I believe that this issue of abortion has been settled law under our United States Constitution. Um, but it also the premise of this bill I have issue with because as Senator Kiffmeyer mentioned, it assumes that women don't have a choice. Well, we do. We have a choice to be in the situation where we're actually carrying a child. We made that choice. We have a choice to go to the doctor and go sit there and listen to our options and to perform whatever procedures. We have a choice and they have a choice. I don't think uh, having an oral discussion is going to change that choice, frankly, but and, you know, we're talking about not mandating. The language in the bill is a mandated bill. It says shall. It doesn't say may. I think I'd be more comfortable if it said may, but it says shall on line 3.21. And a physician or a physician's agent shall. It doesn't say may. It's not permissive language, so it is a mandate. And it seems to be very prescriptive on a very personal decision, a personal um, health care decision between patient and doctor and to have some of the most recognized and prestigious organizations in our that represent those doctors in our state saying that we should oppose this bill. They're not saying they have concerns. They're saying that they oppose the bill. And I can understand for them not being here because I'm even having trouble talking about this subject. It's personal to me too. And I value life. And I want choice in my health care. And I don't want, no um, disrespect to my members, but I don't want any of you to interfere with that choice and decision in my health care. So um, unfortunately, I can't support this bill. And I just, I think there's other things we can do to avoid from women to be in those situations. And I would support those. I just don't think this bill does that. Senator Benson, I was just going to um, just uh, chair in your seat and not say anything to this subject, but I'm looking at uh, Dr. Wood, Doug Woods from MMA, and I just want to point out his last paragraph that I find very disturbing. It says, uh, moreover, this legislation would, be, would set a dangerous precedent by dictating the information that must be shared between a patient and their provider. Is there something wrong with that? That, that there should be an exchange. And then further, it says patients are best served when a patient and their health care team can communicate without interference. This isn't an interference bill. This is about letting the patient know she has the right to have a look at the, at the ultrasound. So I, I will continue to chair and, and use your gavel here, but I, uh, I just wanted to point that out because... We all have very strong opinions, I, I believe, around this table on this particular subject, and I don't think this bill is asking for that much. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Um, I've had the great privilege of working in a crisis pregnancy center for a number of years. I don't do it anymore. But this is not easy. 
and talking to women who don't know how they're going to tell their parents and don't know how they're going to tell their boyfriend. They're going through a lot and giving them one more breath. And I've also talked to women who had abortions and how hard it was for them. The gravity of this decision and we're asking for one pause that if there's an image of a baby that the woman could see that that doctor just say, would you like to see your ultrasound? <coughs> the gravity of the decision warrants the question. That is all I have. And I would like to call up Reverend Dale Worthington, the State Director for Minnesota Prayer Caucus Network, Network please. Witherington. I'm sorry, I, I, Witherington. It's okay, Madam Chair. <laughs> Reverend Worthington, please state your name for the Thank record. you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dale Witherington. I am the State Director for the Minnesota Legislative Prayer Caucus. We are a nationally affili affiliated congressional organization representing over 100,000 Americans who believe in protecting the religious liberties of all Americans, preserving our Judeo-Christian heritage, and promoting prayer. And I come to you today to ask you to support uh, SF 1168. Minnesota has a proud history of protecting every Minnesotan's right to be pro-choice in almost every area of life. We believe in respecting the rights and opinions of people to live according to the dictates of their conscience and live the life they choose as long as their choices do not break the laws or infringe on the rights of other people. This bill is exactly about a woman's right to choose. For most of my life, the issue of a woman's right to choose has been at the center of many heated political debates in virtually every community, region, and state in our great nation. When this debate became major news over 50 years ago, compared to today, we had limited technology available to us to help us make the best decisions for our own health and for the health of our unborn children. I'm guessing that each of us in this room today, including those of you on this committee, have somehow been touched in a positive way in your own life circumstances because of the achievements and advancements of medical technology. Perhaps you or someone you love is alive today because of those medical advancements. Ultrasound technology is one of those tremendously helpful advancements that's meant to do a whole lot more than help expectant parents plan their next gender reveal party. I am not a doctor, but I am the parent of four, the grandparent of six, and the pastor to an awful lot of people who've given birth over my 40 plus career as a, in pastoral ministry. I don't think I need to be a licensed medical practitioner to convince any of us here on how helpful ultrasound technology has been in many of those pregnancies over the uh, four plus decades. The point is this, every woman has the right to know the results of her ultrasound before exercising her right to have or not to have an abortion. Every woman has the right to have every bit of medical assistance available to her when she's making the decision to birth a life or stop a life. This is about a woman's right to choose. Please maintain Minnesota's proud history. Don't take away a woman's right to access all available medical assistance, including an ultrasound, as she weighs her options whether to birth or terminate a child's life. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Worthington. Uh, Senator Matthews. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the testimony that's been shared. And like you stated, Madam Chair, this is an issue that many of us feel deeply about all around this table. And I support this because it is one very small step just requiring to ask a question, as many questions need to be asked in, in many different medical procedures. Um, but this bill is not reversing Roe versus Wade or outlawing abortion or getting in between uh, what a final decision will be. This is one small step 
of asking one simple question to make sure that all information has been considered, that there's one final moment of pause before a final decision that is irreversible and frankly would get in the way between a fetus and her doctor in the future. And the gospel commands us to let the little children come and forbid them not because of such are the kingdom of heaven. And if we've ever believed or repeated the phrase that, um, that the industry has tried to use of saying we want this to be safe, legal, and rare, then we should uh, all support an opportunity to make it just a little bit more rare than it is today. And a colleague of mine on the other side recently made a comment uh, on a different topic that I did think was fitting in saying that the measure of our humanity is measured by how we care for our most vulnerable. And so I, I do support this bill. I hope that everybody will join me in that. And I wanna thank Senator Benson for bringing this forward. Senator Marty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, think, I think I can guess that the majority of this committee and the majority of the Senate may not support abortion being a legal option for women. I think some of us in the committee do very much believe it should be one. And, and when you're saying, well, this is not mandate on them, this is not anything onerous, this is just a minor change, um, the people who in general don't think it should be a legal option for women are putting up barriers. And this is, a, I would argue, a relatively small barrier in that process. But it's the first time we're stepping in here in a way that I don't think we should for political reasons to push an agenda that is telling we're going to interfere with the doctor-patient relationship and the obstetricians, gynecologists, the Minnesota Medical Association, others are saying we don't want you to interfere in this process and it's not being interfered in because we think that's going to give better care. It's because some people want to make sure that we are not, that it's less likely there's going to be an abortion. And I think it's something that I'm not female. I've never been pregnant. I'm a father of two, proud father of two, but I don't think it's my job or our job to be making these decisions for women. And I think when the doctors are coming in and saying, we are handling this well, I think that's a better way to deal with it than say we're going to mandate that you must notify them that they have an option to do this. I think one of the witnesses or one of the statements we were told, somebody saying, well, when I had an abortion a number of years ago, I, I asked for it and I wasn't given the right to see it. I was told I couldn't see it. Um, to me, we're going to get into more fighting. I don't think we should be interfering in that doctor-patient relationship for what I would argue is political purposes to do this. You and I have very different views of whether abortion should be legal or not, but I, I don't think that this is a help. We've had this bill before. We've had this bill a number of times, or bills like this, I think several times before. I'm sure we're probably going to have them again, but I, I don't think we're making decisions that are helpful to our healthcare system. I, you call it an industry center, Matthews. I, I think this is doctors and their patients making decisions that they should make, not us. And I don't think this is a decision that's designed to facilitate better doctor-patient relationships. I think this is a decision that's meant to facilitate what some people here would hope be the outcome of those decisions. So I, I don't support this bill. I think it's a mistake and I, I don't think it's the biggest bill we before us, but I don't think it's a, a step forward. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as in prior years, I want to also express my opposition to this bill. Um, I do not think it furthers care for women or um, helps them beyond what their doctors are required to provide to them in terms of care today. And we are dictating um, language that they, doctors would need to use in their, um, in the process of working with patients. And I, I strongly object to doing that. 
Um, patients are not better served by that um, being in there. Um, women already have the ability um, to decide what tests and what procedures they want to go through, whether it's um, in terms of abortion or not. And I believe doctors have responsibilities to their patients to make sure that they have the information about the tests that they, they um, say that they're going to provide. Um, that exists today. We don't need additional language. Um, and I think the purposes of the bill, um, it's not just innocuous to add this language. I think it, it's, it has a purpose, and, and I disagree with that purpose. So um, I will be voting no again on this bill. Senator Benson, your final comments? If there oh, I'm sorry, Senator Hayden, I didn't see you. Well, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I guess we've we've had a lot of comments here. I was interested in really listening, um, especially to the women on the committee, including Senator Benson, about this. I think that I really feel strongly about uh, this is a, a a decision that a woman makes, um, um, and I wanted to hear the different sides of that. And then, of course, as always, we kind of jump in and want to. To, to, to start to comment on what women need to do with their own bodies. Uh, I will say this, and I grew up and still uh, consider myself a Christian, and, and I take some exception uh, to uh, using uh, references, uh, religious references, or references of the Bible in this uh, conversation. I don't think that it is appropriate, and with all due respect to the pastors on the table in the dais and the pastors that have come to testify, that certainly you're right. Um, but I had the same conversation with a pastor in my district about marriage. And, and I was very clear in telling him that my job is to represent the people of my district, some who are Christian, some who are Jewish, some who are Muslim, and some who don't believe. And my job is to ensure that I listen to everybody and make the best decision and not let their particular doctrine, their particular belief system drive my decision making. And so with that, uh, the people in my community overwhelmingly want to continue to make sure that the woman has the right to choose without these other interferences and this slippery slope that I think that we're going down each and every year. So I'm not going to support the bill, but I do take some objection. With all due respect to my good friend, Senator Matthews, and the pastor that's here, don't it's not personalizing this. I don't want to want you guys to come and get me. I still want you to pray for me, but I just don't think that this is the appropriate place uh, to make those references. Senator Matthews. To that point, Madam Chair, Senator Hayden, I will always keep you in my prayers. <laughs> Senator Franson. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of just thoughts. Um, because sometimes we legislate with good intentions and they have unintended consequences. Um, and I'm a lawyer, so I like to parse words. Um, on line 3.21, it says during the course of a patient's abortion. I'm not sure when that is. And here's a scenario I'm thinking. You know, a lot of women might go and think of having an abortion because they're not ready to be parents. Some women have no choice because their fetus is not viable. So if we can think of that situation and requiring a parent, a woman, to have to look at an, at an ultrasound during that painful procedure to begin with, and I don't know how you make an exception, um, just the thought that not everyone's going there because they have you know, a choice of whether they want to be a parent, whether they're ready. But there's a lot of fertility issues and a lot of fetuses that are not viable in this world. And and that is a loss. And to put this, I think, in law might make those situations outright cruel. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, if there's a way that you can fix that language or um, just keep it in mind that this is not, this is a very delicate situation in many cases. And I would rather see this as a standard of care that it's part, like, like you mentioned, we do ultrasounds already as a standard of care. You can ask this question as a standard of care, but why do we have to mandate it? I think we can really trust our, our medical doctors and, and the standard of care that they've adopted as a profession. So I would like to see that to be the way that we fix this issue. 
Thank you. Senator Benson. Madam Chair, there is an exception to the woman's right to know if there is anomaly incompatible with life. So to Senator Franzen's initial point, and, and I would hope that these conversations would be the standard of care, but we are going to make it clear in this language that if an ultrasound is performed, that a woman has a right to see it should be offered. Um, we don't need to keep the truth from women. With that, final comments, Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and as we've, as this conversation has evolved, I'll bring you back to the beginning. This is the mother of a friend of my son's who learned about 3D ultrasounds, and then a doctor who worked at an ultrasound clinic who had met with and worked with mothers and fathers who upon seeing their ultrasound changed their view of what was happening in their life. And that is a good thing. It is good that when you have more information, you realize that your life has changed and that you can make the best choices when you have the information about what is happening in your life. That's why this bill is here. It's based on my experience in a crisis pregnancy center. It's based on friends who've had abortions. This isn't here because I'm trying to hurt someone or take away a doctor's rights. This is because this is one of the very real conversations that we have as part of our public policy. This isn't about barriers. This is because abortion does end a life and it changes the life of parents forever. And it is worthy of our conversation. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd ask that this be laid over. Thank you very much, Senator Benson. And members, um, that was a very good conversation. Uh, Senator Vincent, thank you very much for bringing this bill forward. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Senator. Yeah.